hello 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 everybody thank you so much for joining today um so welcome back this is soul journeys with myself saba and we're now on episode four which is amazing um so so far we've in, well i've interviewed some incredible women all about their different stories their healing journeys their faith journeys throughout life and already i have learned so much and i hope whoever's been here and has been watching from the start is learning a lot as well hello to everybody that's here thank you for joining um so just to tell you a little bit about soul journeys i believe that everybody that we come across in life is a teacher in some way or another and we've all got something to learn from each other um, and that's pretty much why i do the work that i do um i just believe that we can all help each other to grow and to become better human beings and that's what this is all about um so if you don't know about me um, i'm just going to give you a quick overview um i'm saba i'm a writer artist creator multi-passionate creator and journalist um and all of my work focuses on the themes of spirituality consciousness self-growth personal development and becoming the change that we wish to see in the world um so like i said we're now on episode four of soul journeys and today's special guest is somebody that I'm still, I'm just waiting for her to join, um, but she's just an incredible lady, somebody whose work I only came across maybe about two years ago or so, um, but whose work I absolutely fell in love with. Um, so Sakina Pilgrim is a poet, and the way she weaves her words is just so breathtaking and so beautiful to me, and I'm sure to many, many others out there. She's also a performer, a workshop facilitator. She does so much and she's somebody that I'm truly inspired by. Um, and also she's on this path, this very deep path of spirituality and inner peace and consciousness and healing, um, which is why I just can't wait to speak to her. So instead of me rambling on and talking about Sakina, let's just bring her in and get this started. And guys, if you have any questions, feel free to post them. And if we have time at the end, so I'm just going to add her in now and get this show on the road. Hello, hey. Kina. Salam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, really good. Alhamdulillah, very honoured to be to be here with you. Um, very honoured to be on your platform. So thank you. Well, I'm honoured to have you here. Um, so I'm going to start with a question mm. that you have been starting with us um, in the four week poetry workshop. So firstly. How is your heart? How is my heart? That's a really nice question. It's so interesting when I'm the one always asking you guys. Yeah. <laughs> my heart is good. Um, my heart is very content. Um, you know, I think obviously we're in a very different circumstance as human beings that we've never really been in before. But somehow I find um, a lot of peace from from um, a statement which is Alhamdulillah ala kuli hal. You know, mm -hmm. trying to be in a state of alhamdulillah in whatever state you're in. And I think that's a kind of, that's the quest of the believer to try and find that state of hand wherever we are. So I'm trying to be present with Allah and look for the khair in mm -hmm. kind of the difficulty. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So alhamdulillah, I'm really enjoying um, having this, this time to be still. My heart is, my heart is good, you know, <laughs> trying to really connect with the Quran in Ramadan for the first time in Arabic. So that's been yeah. a bit of a journey. Um, mm -hmm. But good, all good. I can't yeah. complain. Alhamdulillah. Glad to hear that. Is there anything that you've been struggling with at all um, during this lockdown period? Oh, the connection. Come back, Sakina. Is it me or is it Sakina? Oh, I think we lost Kina. Okay, let's get her back. Let's get her back. She's coming. She's coming. Alhamdulillah. Sorry. Oh, it's, okay. uh, my is not very good. Oh, no. um, I have to change my device. So I missed, your se I missed the second question that you said. Yeah, so I said, is there, is there anything you've been struggling at all uh, with during this lockdown period? Um, A few, well, a few things. Um, The first is that 
um, within this period, there were there was quite a few trips I was supposed to have made. Mm-hmm. So me and my friends had planned to go to Jordan. We hadn't booked our flights yet, but we planned to go to Jordan. I'm really really excited about that. So that's on hold. Um, also, I'm starting, inshallah, to do some some Sufi women retreats in Fez. Mm-hmm. So my friends and I had planned to go to Fez to start doing the groundwork and finding the spas and the restaurants and the places we would go to. So that that's also on hold and then also my husband and I had planned to spend the last 10 days of Ramadan in in Senegal Mm -hmm. um and that's also not gonna happen so I think yeah there's I think just travel things really those Mm -hmm. things have kind of been a little bit like darn but at the same time I think you know there's just so much blessing in just being still I found for myself just being being still being at home so yeah I agree with that completely. I believe like this time has come for a reason and we're yeah. all having to stop and reflect and like truly awaken to who we are within. So Absolutely. I think it's a really, really beautiful time. Um, mm, so let's get like... back to you um, <laughs> on your life journey so far. Could you give us a little bit of an overview of just your journey so far? You don't need to go into specific details, but anything that really stands out to you on your journey? Um, so when you say journey in the sense of like spiritual journey or just life journey? Just, just or... generally like how were you brought up? Um, how did you mm. find faith? That kind of thing. We're going to go more in depth into these things mm. anyway. Um, but just like a general yeah. overview just for the people. Yeah, so um, I'm, I was born and raised in a city called Bristol, which is about two, two and a half hours outside of London, southwest England. Um, so I was raised there by my mother, I live with my brother. Um, and I guess um, my background is Caribbean, so I'm from my family from Jamaica. So I wasn't raised with a specific faith, like we are Christian or we are anything. I had exposure to, to different things, but I think I would say the faith that had the most resonance as a child was Rastafarianism, actually. So my older brother was a Rastafarian my aunt was my parents were Rastafarian before I was born Mm -hmm. so I think that played a big part of like my identity um also in the sense that Rastafarianism is a is I guess it's like a kind of it's a it's a rebellious movement in a way it's a rebellious spiritual movement it was rebelling against colonialism rebelling against yeah. the way in which christianity was imposed upon people of african descent so i love mm-hmm. i love coming from that and i think that kind of spiritual rebel mystic kind of background yeah. this stays with me you know what mm-hmm. i mean um it's a big part of my identity um yeah i kind of I guess when I was in my teens, I moved to London to do my degree in English literature and Caribbean mm-hmm. studies. Um, from there, that's when I joined with Manira and we started a group called Poetic Pilgrimage, which is like, yeah. I guess, a hip hop spoken word duo mm-hmm. at the end of my degree. So um, in my final year, I converted to Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was because I was reading, I had to do uh, an, an essay about a black radical. Mm-hmm. So black radicalism was the name of the module. So I decided to do it on Malcolm X. Yeah. Um, and basically, I guess his the autobiography of Malcolm X, his journey to, to yeah. Islam um, really resonated with me because I think growing up, Malcolm X was a big part of my mm-hmm. childhood um, landscape. Like my mom was very like adamant that we would learn about black black leaders and black you know black people mm-hmm. in history. So I think reading his autobiography, but within the context of Islam, mm-hmm. I think it just sh- so it did something to me. I don't know. I couldn't really fight it. I was trying to. I was like, oh my god. I'm starting to fall in love with Islam. This was not on my this was not on my plan. I didn't plan to be a Muslim at all. Um, alhamdulillah, we, I guess we can talk about that a bit later. But I converted to Islam with my best friend at the Manira, and then um, we kind of began poetic pilgrimage. We launched that. I guess we started to take that as uh, as professionally as professionally as we could as you know hijabi rappers. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so did you, embrace, did you embrace the hijab straight away, like as soon as you converted, or was it a gradual process? Yeah, straight away, straight away. <laughs> I, I, I had, <laughs> it's kind of funny, I had really long dreadlocks, and I think oh, my no. identity, yeah, and, like half of them were blonde and the other half were black, and oh, it, wow. it was a big part of my identity, like, <laughs> oh, you know, the girl with the dreads. And I think when I came to Islam, I didn't want any... I didn't want, I just wanted to be like a baby, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't want any identity. So I shaved, mm-hmm. I shaved my, oh, all my wow. hair, I oh, cut all my hair, shaved all my, shaved yeah. my head. Yeah. And I think that was also because I knew that it would have been really hard for me to wear hijab mm-hmm. with my hair because I really mm-hmm. liked my hair and it would have been hard yeah. to cover it. So yeah. I was like, Zoop, we'll take that off wow. and um, adopted hijab. Yeah, mm-hmm. straight away, straight mm-hmm. away. 
that's yeah, amazing. Really I, find that, um, I find a lot of people when they're on a spiritual path or they come to a spiritual path, the hair cutting process is a big part of yeah. it from a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like what you said about being like reborn and being a new baby. Yeah. Like, kind of. It's exactly. Different. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also for a lot of people, hair holds a lot of energy, hair mm. holds a lot of memory, mm. hair holds a lot of identity. Um, I guess for women, it's a big part of our beautification in a way, you know yeah, what I mean? We, we hold our hair in quite high esteem. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, I just didn't want, I didn't want any of it. I was just like, I just, I just didn't want... I just wanted to be brand new. I wanted my only identity to, to be Muslim. You know, I didn't want to be like, oh, yeah. Jamaican, Rasta. <laughs> I just, I was just like, no, like, I just yeah. want to be, no, I just want to be a slave of Allah. And I think that was why I was quite, it was quite extreme. My yeah. cousin, when she, my cousin, when I was living with my cousin at the time, and she, she cried when she came in and saw me with a bald head. She was like, oh my God, you know, everything's changed. But I think I had to be that drastic, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? That's, I'm a I bit guess, I guess everything did change from that point onwards. Absolutely. Um, so obviously a big part of your work is your poetry and the mm. words that you so beautifully put together and share with the world. Um, how did you actually discover your talent or your love for writing and poetry? Mm. So <laughs> I think like as a child, I was a bit extra, like I was super emotional. <laughs> I, was always, I was really over the top. I'm still a bit extra to be fair, but like, <laughs> so I, I, I used to like, Again. I said it's fine we still love you <laughs> <laughs> so I used to write a lot of letters like sometimes if I'd be upset with my mum I'd write these letters like you don't love me I'm adopted no one cares about me you know what I mean so I'd write these letters <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like growing up on like home and away in neighbours, you see all these like Australian kids be like, you don't love me. So you try it out with your black mother. It just all doesn't. Drama, it doesn't yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> my cousin's online, she's like, yeah, you're 100% as a child extra. So, um, and then um, I remember I was about 16, 17 years old. This is really the, how the journey began. I was about 16, 17 years old. In Bristol, we have like a kind of like, a bit like Notting Hill Carnival, but a smaller one in Bristol. So I met, I met somebody there and um, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And then I remember he just disappeared, like out of, into thin air. Never heard from him again. And it was really difficult for me to process that. So what I started to do was write letters. So I used to write really like long letters and sometimes I would send them to him sometimes I wouldn't and actually I realized that what was he, what I was doing is I was processing my emotions through the writing of letters and I think that was the first time I was able to put words onto emotions like I was really trying mm -hmm. to kind of articulate a particular pain that I had yeah. and so sometimes I would send him the letters and sometimes I wouldn't but it was just the process that's why I came to realize the process and I'd read them to my friends and my friends would be like, oh my God, you write really well. Mm -hmm. So then um, that was kind of really where my writing really began mm -hmm. in just letter writing really. Yeah. And then um, when I was kind of about 18, I used to listen to a lot of like Erica Badu and mm -hmm. Lauren Hill and that kind of thing. And I started songwriting before mm -hmm. I started writing poems. Mm -hmm. I used to write li po like lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I was like, these, these are poems, you know yeah. what I mean? And then... <laughs> That's kind of really where it began from there. Okay, amazing. Yeah, um, so not a conventional poetry. I wasn't, I didn't start off being no. inspired by poems. It was really about, yeah, it just came in an unconventional way, I think. Yeah. Okay, amazing. And you said that you started off like in your teens writing songs. Did you ever like sing and perform these songs or was it just the writing? Yeah, so when I was younger in, in our community, they had like a, a talent show for like inner city kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was in a group, it's quite embarrassing the name, but I was in a group called Brown Sugar. <laughs> Okay. brown sugar and we used to sing uh, like covers I guess like R&B kind of covers and stuff yeah. and then um when I was when I was writing the lyrics I was also like partnering with another friend at school so she was like a jazz singer so I would write the lyrics and she would make the melody so yeah we I did used to kind of sing and different things yeah <laughs> where did your journey of actually starting to perform and share your poetry with the world begin where did that start so that began, again, I think it was just like a local poetry night. Um, in, it was actually in London. So I went to like a poetry night in London, in South London. And I think that was the first time I kind of performed by myself. Mm -hmm. um, at the poetry night was also Manira, who would later become my band member. So I guess mm -hmm. we both decided around that time that we wanted to kind of collaborate. Maybe I guess it was also mm -hmm. because we were probably too shy to be solo artists <laughs> at the time. 
you know what I mean? So I think it was like, <laughs> let's just kind of do something together, you know what I mean? And so we, we set up Poetic Pilgrimage from there, really. It was, mm. it was around that time and we kind of, yeah, we always wanted to include hip hop and spoken word and different things. So yeah, I want to say like my first year of university, that's when Poetic Pilgrimage began. And so most of my performance career has always been, you know, well, the, well, the early part of my performance career was as a duo. Um, but over the last, yeah, maybe like six, seven years, we've been doing a lot of solo work. Yeah. 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 What was that feeling when you first stepped on stage and shared your poetry? Wow. Um, I remember the first time as Poetic Pilgrimage we performed. Very powerful, very powerful. I mean, it's always nice when you've got your family and friends in the audience as well, because everyone was making so much noise for us. We really felt like we'd made it, you know what I mean? So I think there was definitely a lot of support. And I think also coming from like, you know, African, African Caribbean communities where when your content is connected to your people, or connected to the story of your people, people are going to love and support you anyway. Do you know what I mean? So I think we had a lot of support and love because of the content that we that we were communicating we had a message it wasn't just um poetry for the sake of it it wasn't just that we wanted to kind of be famous it was because we really deeply believed that we had something to communicate and so i think that was powerful when when you're performing to your community and people are resonating with you and they're they're, they're supporting you and they're showing you love you know did you realize at that point that this is what you wanted or needed to do with your life yeah I think it was always like, we spoke about it a lot, this idea that like f f for us, and for me, I can speak for myself as an artist, mm -hmm. for me not to do what I do would be almost like you asking me not to breathe. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's that intrinsic to my identity, not even identity, to my being. You know what I mean? It's like not being able to express myself, not being able to be heard, not being able to have a platform is it's really important. Even even within, I, I can even say that even within the context of marriage, like my husband knows, like <laughs> if I need to be heard, you know, and, and vice versa. It's not just I need to be heard, he also needs to be heard. But this yeah. idea of expression, not being able to express oneself, not being able to give, to be given a platform. And I think that's probably why a lot of my work is also about trying to do the same thing for other people. Mm -hmm. Because I recognize if you don't have a platform, if you don't have a space to speak your truth, uh, and e whether it be positive or negative, the only place that then goes is inward. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it ends up eating, yeah. eating, you know? So it's really about, it's about that. And I also feel like the soul itself um, wants to express its mm -hmm. beauty. Like, I feel like that's a part of, it's a part of the human to want to share. Like when we make, when we do beautiful things or when we have, you know, things within, we, we want to bring it out. So mm -hmm. it's a big part of who I am. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. That's really beautiful. 100% agree with all mm. of that. Um, so your work is very much like for me, um, as somebody that loves your work, I see a lot of healing through your work and like you're healing yourself, but you're also healing others through what you write as well. So what does healing actually mean to you? And what does healing through poetry mean to you as well? Oh, that's quite a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think... I know, right? So healing, I guess, well, might be, these are my thoughts on healing. I think that we don't, anyone who regards themselves as a healer, like, so I also studied Reiki, for example, right? So anyone who regards themselves as someone within a kind of healing capacity will never say that they themselves heal somebody. Yeah. What, what they do is they provide a platform mm -hmm of balance for the for the person to heal themselves you know mm -hmm. what i mean that's like if we're talking about the body it's not mm -hmm. that the healer heals your wounds or your your, your whatever uh, malady you have but they pro they provide they almost help your body to find equilibrium so that it can heal itself mm -hmm. and i so i feel the same way with regards to like poetry and words and even when i'm teaching as well like i don't see that the poetry is necessarily healing but mm -hmm. there's something there must be something in the words if it resonates with with, with you mm -hmm. that allows your soul to find a certain level of ease that it can heal itself you know what i mean and i think that is that's quite important i think also though what you said is that i'm healing myself through the poetry mm -hmm. and and, and i can also say that to be true so mm -hmm. in that respect if the poetry has is healing me then there's a, obviously a strong possibility that it's going to heal the listener or the reader as well. Um, so there's that.
And then I think, um, what's, what's the, was there was two questions. What, yeah, I said um, also, what does healing through poetry mean to you? Yeah, so um, as you know, I'm currently doing my master's in creative writing for therapeutic purposes. And so I guess there are different things we learn about the significance of writing when it comes to healing. There are so many different elements to it. One thing that's kind of resonant with me at the moment is this idea of narrative therapy, where you almost, through words and through writing, you rewrite parts of your journey that might have been unfinished or might have been traumatized and you rewrite your ending. You know, there's something in almost, you know, yeah, it's almost like you write yourself out of whatever trauma you've been through. So there's definitely different ways in which writing can heal. But I think for myself, primarily, the process is getting it out. It's just this idea of like, holding space for yourself, allowing whatever it is inside to come out and not judging it. As you know, writing with me, like I'm very much like, don't judge what comes out, don't think too deeply about it, just let it be. And then look, look at it over a period of time and you might find actually, there's some really important messages in here. Mm -hmm. for oneself you know um so definitely that definitely just you know and I think also what else is healing about about poetry is that ultimately what you're doing is you're making beauty out of maybe in some cases a, a difficult situation when you when you're making art there's rhyme there's rhythm there's metaphor it's beauty and there's something about beauty that heals us that's yeah. why we, we, we look at art and we like nature. There's something about beauty that restores a part of ourselves. And so poetry and any kind of art form has the capacity to heal just by way of beauty, just by way of the rhyme or by way of the recitation and, you know, the words. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that completely. Like, we are made to, to give what we're here to give. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly what you're doing, which is, which is beautiful. Um, so this is, this is quite a personal question now, um, just as a creator myself, um, how do you separate the ego from your work? Because that's mm. something that I quite struggle with sometimes, like I wonder uh, why is there not more people reading, why is there not more people mm. watching, how do you separate what you're truly doing from your ego? <laughs> that's, that's, a really good, kind of <laughs> that's a good question. Um, first of all, I love your work, by the way. I think you're an incredible writer and having the opportunity to witness your words every week for the last month has been really powerful. So thank you. I just want to say that. It's a big you up. It's mashallah, incredible. Um, so it's funny because when I converted to Islam, I came across this word, which now we use it, you know, it's part of your life all the time. Mm -hmm. But this word, mashallah, for me, was a very profound word because what you're basically saying is that when people praise you or when people you know um admire you you're giving it back to allah straight away you know and like so so we perform a lot of people you know as, as new muslims people be like oh i love your poetry mashallah was the first word that would come out of our mouths because we're like but it's allah who has inspired the pen you know allah has who has inspired the 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 art itself and I remember that when I first converted to Islam I couldn't it's like I couldn't write my pen froze I couldn't write for months and it was it was strange because I was someone that was always writing and it stopped and it was very humbling for me because it made me realize that it's not about you like it comes through you but it's not you you know and the first poem I ever wrote was called Bismillah you know which again that was the opening okay in the name of Allah and so that for me opened me again as an artist mm -hmm. and so i think the term mashallah for me is a very important term when it comes to the art because you it's mm -hmm. like you, you recognize that it's not really about i recognize that allah took it away like allah can mm -hmm. take that away allah can take away my voice allah can take yeah. away my ability to write can mm -hmm. take away my my mental capacity so mm -hmm. everything that is praiseworthy mm -hmm. comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my in my opinion mm -hmm. um when it comes to like you said about more people why don't more people read my my stuff like i don't i also go through that too i'm like yeah but my poems are good too you know but then i also think about it in the sense of like risk you know what i mean mm -hmm. like so, like i see like if like if we have if we as artists recognize that what we have is risk you know what i mean it's mm -hmm. it's something that is um Pro not providence i'm trying to think of how would you what would the word would you how would you translate risk exactly sustenance sustenance that's it right so you recognize that what you have is sustenance and if it's supposed to reach people it will reach people and if it's not it won't you know what i mean like 
it's like if you've got a, if you're a, a jewelry maker or a fashion designer like you make your you make your product and if it's supposed to reach pe the people that it's written for it will and if not it won't you know what i mean so i think trying to kind of look at it in that respect and not kind of attach myself too much to the mm -hmm. to the pr product itself to the poems yeah. itself but more like the benefit you know what i mean it's more like yeah. i want to i don't know if i'm rambling but i'm just i guess no, my no, point no. Makes, makes sense yeah. but it's just more like it's it's everything that we that we put out into the world is a form of sustenance and who is supposed to reach will reach and who is not supposed to reach it won't reach you know what i mean and everything also in time i'm also learning about stubborn you know what i mean like being patient mm -hmm. that when allah wants you to be seen and when allah wants you to be known and when allah wants mm -hmm. to use you for to pr present a message like he will you know so just being mm -hmm. patient with allah's timing as well <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I'm just going to refer to my notes now because I've got a lot here. <laughs> um, can you tell us about um, some times in your life where poetry or words have really saved you from the darkness? If you don't mind sharing, if it's not too, yeah. too deep. <laughs> The, the, I just, I'll just say the first thing that came to my mind. I don't know if I'd say, I mean, it's not like a deep, deep, deep uh, dramatic experience, mm -hmm. but I remember, I guess, looking at it now from a perspective of Tasawwuf, being like a woman on the Sufi path. And there are moments when you're yearning for your Lord, like you want nearness, mm -hmm. you know, and I go through that a lot. I'm like, Ya Allah, please let me be close, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling, I remember I was in Senegal, I was feeling quite low actually about just feeling distant, you know what I mean? Just feeling like mm -hmm. I wasn't connected properly. Mm -hmm. And I came across this poem by Hafiz, um, mm -hmm. and he basically is saying like, I, I don't know it word for word, but what he's basically saying is like, don't be hard on yourself, you know, like you're trying to dance on the, on the, you know, like in a ballroom with the most unpredictable of partners, like Allah is unpredictable, like, and so just be grateful that you've gotten this far, you know what I mean? Like, don't feel like you, that you've um, failed or anything like that, but actually be grateful that you've, you know really what you're saying is the fact that you even feel disconnected is already a virtue mm -hmm. because there are some people that don't even care to want to be connected in the first place to god let alone be mournful that they're not where they want to be you know what i'm saying and so it was kind of like it's something at least i find it but it was basically like you've not done too bad you're already on the on the you know on the dance floor but you you're just starting with an unpredictable dancer and allah will do as he wills when he wills so just be patient and 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 be be gentle with yourself and i was like oh yeah i needed that so i think that definitely saved me from a moment of like navel gazing feeling sorry for myself <laughs> <laughs> that's really really beautiful thank you for sharing that um so obviously a lot of your work focuses on spirituality and your connection to your lord and your path that you're on um could you possibly share some insights into your spiritual journey and why this path that you found is so important mm. to you mm. alhamdulillah of course it's my favorite kind of question <laughs> <laughs> so um so alhamdulillah converted to islam and, um, you know, as a new Muslim, you're learning all the rules, you know, how to pray, wudu, da da da, Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Like, you just basically, you want to get it right, you know. And I think yeah. you don't want to make any mistakes. You don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, I think already as a convert, you have this feeling that someone's watching over you, trying to see if you're going to slip up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think the primary thing was like Muslim, like be Muslim. Mm -hmm. But I've always heard about the spiritual path with. Breaking up slightly, Sakina. <laughs> oh. Oh. I don't know if anybody else, is it breaking up for anybody else? I can't hear you. Okay, the connection just went, guys. I'm just waiting for Sakina to 
possibly come back if she's still here. Uh, just bear with us. Hopefully she'll be back in a second. Sukina, Sukina, where are you? Oh, it's pixelated on your side as well. Okay, I'm just going to send her a message on WhatsApp, so just bear with me two seconds. Okay, okay, she's here. She's here. She's coming, she's coming. Hopefully she's coming. Hello? Is it working? Hi Sakina, can you hear me? Have you got 4G by any chance? Maybe yeah, you can try on that. Oh, okay. It's just, it's very glitchy. Maybe try the Wi Fi. Uh, it's very, very glitchy. It's very pixelated and very glitchy on my side. Eek. I'm sure we will resolve this. <laughs> All right, let's just try. How about now? Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, that's better. <laughs> Don't move. Oh no, it's gone again. Yeah, I could try starting the live again, but um, I can try. Okay, guys, I might restart the live and come back and hope. Okay. Oh, wait. I can see you. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, let me try my... I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. I think. <laughs> okay. I can hear you. Yeah, it's a bit... Uh, I might restart the live and if you can just join us again, if that's okay. Uh, I don't know if she can hear me. Okay, let's restart this. Guys, whoever's here, please... Call Hello everybody, welcome back to Soul Journeys. This is episode four um, and for those that joined us last time you'll know that Sakina Pilgrim was here and we're having such an amazing conversation, such a fascinating conversation about spirituality and unfortunately the connection was really bad um, so we got cut off. Sorry you can see my strap on there. Um, yeah so the connection got cut off. Um, so today uh, I'm joined by the amazing Sakina Pilgrim again who is a poet, performer, playwright, workshop facilitator, seeker, dreamer, believer. Um, and there's so much that I find in common with this incredible lady as well. And I just think some of the conversations that we're gonna have today are incredibly important. Um, so yeah, last time that she was here, we spoke more about her life in terms of her work, her poetry, um, her workshops and that kind of thing. But today we're gonna get quite deeply into the spiritual side of things so for anybody that's interested in that kind of stuff stick around um Sakina's here now so I'm just gonna add her in and let's pray for good connection today so she's on the way I hope <laughs> hello how are you I'm good how are you alhamdulillah good thank you 
And as always, let's begin with, how is your heart? Mm, my heart is good. I had a bit of an interesting morning. Um, so it's interesting when your heart is generally at ease and then something mm. happens that kind of triggers your heart, like finding the things to do to kind of bring your heart ease. So um, I was listening to Ayata Sakina. Um, mm. You know, it's like all the verses of the Quran that mention Sakina, like tranquility. So whenever mm. my heart is feeling a little bit unsettled, I always play... I had the Sakina and it really helped. So <clears throat> just before I joined the conversation, that was what I was um, doing to bring ease to my heart. <clears throat> so I think sometimes it's good to know like what can be your little first aid kit for your heart when it is feeling uncomfortable. Like what what do you do to kind of bring your heart back to balance? So that's yeah. where where I am basically. Yeah, alhamdulillah, like, <clears throat> like you have those tools and you know exactly what to do. Whereas I feel there's a lot of us that maybe we don't know, we don't know how to get back to that place. So maybe yeah. we can get into that a little yeah. while later. Um, so obviously last time we had some connection issues, Bismillah, this time mm. we'll be okay. Um, and we, in the last episode, we basically delved into your life, into the poetry side of things. Mm. And we did start on the spirituality, but yeah. it was so bad. And this is also going to be as well. So let's just... Let's just start from the beginning again um, mm. and get right into it. Um, so to begin with, can you kind of tell us about your journey with converting to Islam and your faith so far? Mm, definitely. So um, as I was mentioning last time, I come from a background wherein we believed in God and God was present, but I wasn't raised with a formal religion. <clears throat> I had members of my family that were Christian. I also had members of my family that were Rastafarian. <clears throat> I think for me, the Rastafarian <clears throat> movement was probably the most influential in my life, mm. in in my character, um, because it was a, it's a movement that contains spirituality, but also the fight for resistance and freedom mm. for people. So that was a big part of my kind of foundation. And um, I think growing up, that was you know something that really stuck with me. Mm. Um, I came to Islam accident. I could always say. It was really I mean it was accidental to me it wasn't obviously accidental to Allah mm -hmm. but um, I was doing my uh, master uh, my, my degree and I had to do a module on black radicalism oh. um, so uh, I decided to write, the, write an essay about Malcolm X mm -hmm. and I think even though I was aware of him my whole life I think for some reason studying him at that moment it just kind of opened up Islam for me in, in a way that I wasn't anticipating and I remember feeling like oh my god what's happening to me I can't believe I'm starting to fall in love with this religion like Islam was not on my to-do list you know what I mean what, what was it about um, Malcolm X's story that really stood out to me I think it was the Hajj it was definitely the Hajj and the peace that he felt when he had found you know I guess Sunni Islam let's say or like when he found Islam I think I'd always like like at the time my group I was already in a group called Poetic Pilgrimage so the mm. idea of a pilgrimage and traveling for God or traveling to mm. God was something that was always a part of my 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 life I guess I like the idea of it so when I read about him going on Hajj and what he experienced and I think also this real deep submission and surrender to the oneness of Allah I think that was like oh my God, I want what he has, you know? It was really like, I was like, I want that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I did more research. I was at university, so I had access to like academic books about Islam, not just like dawah literature, you know what I mean? It wasn't just yeah. like, Islam is the right way. It was more like, you know, really looking into Islam historically. And I remember reading a book by someone who was actually a feminist. She was a secular, Moroccan secular feminist mm -hmm. called Fatima Malisi. But she had this book called Women and Islam or Women in Islam. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful, like, because in the book, she was really painting a portrait of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the women in his life and how actually oftentimes when we are being told as women, you know, when hadiths are being pushed upon us or presented mm -hmm. to us, oftentimes it's half quote, it's half quoted mm -hmm. uh, hadith, you yeah. know, they're not telling the full story. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes we find ourselves in positions of being pushed out or being subdued mm -hmm. from the religion when actually that's a cultural expression. It's not mm -hmm. from Islam, and definitely not from the way of Sayyidina Muhammad, mm -hmm. alayhi salatu So I think reading her book, like actually I want to say that like it made me really fall in love with the Prophet Sallallahu mm Alaihi -hmm. Wasallam which is interesting because it's an academic book it wasn't like the mm -hmm. Shama'il or yeah. you know Ashifa all the spiritual books about the Prophet it was very mm -hmm. academic but it was like 
he was someone who loved and advocated for women and women loved him and you know he cared for the for the women of his community and I think yeah that was quite a turning point for me um and then yeah I just eventually got to a point where I was like I can't really fight this can I like really I can't you know and if I claim to be someone who's seeking God or someone who's on a journey to God and this is being really presented to me even though it's in a form that I didn't really choose or what I would want for myself I had to kind of just surrender so did you feel like you were kind of seeking something all along when this came along a hundred percent a hundred percent by that point I had probably gone through so many different Mm. spiritual like journeys and Mm. I was really like interested for a long time in Native American spirituality Mm. and yoga and the philosophy behind Mm. yoga like I said I come from a Rasta background I also used to go to like orthodox Ethiopian church I was interested in Buddhism like I think Mm. by by the time I was Muslim I had almost almost tried to take the best (laughs) of everything and make my own little Mm. way you know um which I guess was the sincerity in in what I was looking for, but also interesting in the sense that like, when Islam was presented to me, I was like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not what I want. Like, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be a Muslim. Like, I didn't want to, you know. Did you kind of have like a negative perception of Islam before? 100%, 100%. I think the city that I was raised in, I guess, first of all, it's also about representation. Like I didn't see myself in Islam growing up, like in the communities yeah. that I'm from, you think, okay, this is a, a you know, Pakistani thing, or this is a Bengali thing. Like in the neighborhood that I live, I've always lived around many masajids, but you never mm-hmm. see, I never saw any black people go to the mosque. Mm-hmm. The first time I started to see black people engaging in Islam is when the Somali community started mm-hmm. to come to the UK, like in the mm-hmm. 90s. But even still, it wasn't like, oh, this is something that I could be part of. I never, mm-hmm. even though I feel quite sad because even though I've lived my whole life across the road from a masjid, there was never once that there was like an open day. Like they came to the neighbors and said, come and learn about Islam mm-hmm. or come and drink tea in the mosque and get to know us like there was not none of that mm-hmm. and like you can think subhanallah your whole life you live across the mm-hmm. road from a masjid and you don't even know i didn't even know it was a mosque i thought maybe is it a temple is it a hindu mm-hmm. i didn't know until i became muslim and i was like hold on mm-hmm. every friday there's a lot of traffic jams around my <laughs> neighborhood and there's loads of men like maybe yeah. this is a masjid and mm-hmm. then even when i eventually did become a muslim and go there they they were so not equipped for women mm. that when we did pray Jumma there they actually didn't even know that we were in the mosque and they locked us in oh, wow. <laughs> so we were locked oh, in the masjid <laughs> but until Asr, you know because yeah. there was no space for women so all of that to say that I didn't really have a positive um understanding of Islam I guess you also hear and although sometimes the narratives mm. are inaccurate but you do hear mm. like oh Arabs came to Africa and they enslaved mm. all black people and da, 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 da. and there's all this kind of even though sometimes the, the backing isn't necessarily the evidence isn't necessarily mm-hmm. strong but yeah. you hear these things and so mm-hmm. it makes you feel like well why would I join a religion that doesn't like black people and also yeah. doesn't respect women you know what I mean yeah. um but then I guess when when you start when I started to do my own research I was like oh my god completely different you know um so yeah <laughs> that's amazing um so then obviously you came to the Sufi path and you found your shade and all of that so can you tell us a little bit about that journey yeah so um before i became muslim i had been aware of sufism i didn't really know exactly like what it was or but i just always knew there was a spiritual dimension to islam which i think is quite important because from the outside looking in when you see islam all you all muslims sometimes all you see is just rules and regulations all you see is what you can and can't do what you have to wear what you shouldn't so it can feel a bit restricted and so I remember before becoming a Muslim knowing there was a spiritual dimension um, and when I embraced Islam the people that I embraced with were people of Tasawwuf so I did have access and I did go to certain Sufi circles but I guess I think I can see the hikmah from Allah that like I didn't meet my community until I had been a Muslim for at least four or five years so I was very grounded in Islam you know what I mean I was grounded in my prayers and grounded in the, just the, the do's and the don'ts really you know the, the, the sharia you need to know um but i think that 
you know, in hindsight, that was really important that I had mm -hmm. that foundation. Yeah. Um, but then like, I got to a point, m myself and my husband, we both got to a point where we were like, something's missing. You know, mm -hmm. we're doing everything correctly. We're doing mm -hmm. the right thing, but the heart just was not being mm -hmm. watered at all, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it was, Yanni, because you're praying and you're, you know, yes. but I'm saying like, there's a whole spiritual world that just was not happening for, for mm -hmm. me at that time. And so, um, yeah, so we were on the lookout, but we didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't find anything. Actually, your, your, your follower, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, is that correct? Yeah. 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 So even that, my, my husband lives in a house with all Maurice and Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Oh, yeah, we love them mm -hmm. and they were lovely people. Yeah. But again, it just wasn't our time you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah. but eventually when i did meet my sheikh um i did meet the sheikh from our community mm -hmm. it was just very random we were invited to like a private lunch in region was that here in london or in london, london. okay <clears throat> we were just invited to a private mm -hmm. lunch um the late Fuad Nahdi, a wonderful, mashallah, man who, who passed away at the beginning of, um, you know, this whole corona epidemic. Um, oh. Someone who was a really important part of my life. He actually um, just, in, he invited us to this lunch. Mm -hmm. He was just like, mm -hmm. come, there's going to be a sheikh from Senegal. And we, we'd always heard about the Sufis of mm -hmm. Senegal. We were very excited. Yeah. Um, and I think when I arrived in the presence of the sheikh, um, there was just a certain level of like, presence and dignity mm -hmm. and honor that i'd never seen before like in a human mm -hmm. being i was like i've never seen a man like you before <laughs> um you know and i did and there was a bit of information about the tanya like on the table mm -hmm. and i think the thing that stood out to me the most um was this this quote by sheikh ahmed tajani who founded our tanya and what mm -hmm. he said was one of his companions had said to him you know in the future will people fabricate things about you will people mm -hmm. lie about you and he said yes and the, the disciple said, what, what is the remedy for this? He said, weigh everything I say on the scale with the Quran and the Sunnah. If it, if it doesn't balance, then it's not for me. And I just love the emphasis mm -hmm. on the Quran and the Sunnah. That for me was really, really important because mm -hmm. oftentimes I have been in spaces where there are people of Tasawwuf or Sufis mm -hmm. and, you know, mashallah, we love the Sufis, but sometimes very interesting things are happening and you're like, yeah, but it's time to pray or, you know, and it's just like, Oh, the love, and, you know, yeah. hands in love, which is fine. Like I, I don't, I don't judge. But for me, yeah. that's what I needed. I needed a path that was Muhammadan, basically, mm -hmm. that followed yeah. Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam to a T in 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 spirit and in letter. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. in word and spirit and letter. Yeah. So that was the beginning of that journey. Yeah. So was that like um, when you met the Sheikh? Was it like a like a instant decision that you wanted to come to this path? Like within like 24 hours, I knew that I wanted to, mm. to join the path. Like I met the sheikh, I did, I, I did a tiny bit of research. I think that quote that I just said, that was enough. I was mm. like, this is it, then this is. Yeah. And I think also what was interesting for me when mm. I met the sheikh, who is the imam of um, Medina Bay, mm. um, Imam Sheikh Tijani Sise, he, what was interesting was coming across the tariqa. And, and even though it's not a race thing, it's not about race, but it was interesting for me to see a black sheikh that had murids of lots of different nationalities, that mm. had Arab murids and Asian murids. And I, I'd never, in my Islamic experience, I'd never seen that before. Because mm. most of the shayukh that, we, that are elevated are usually maybe Arab descent or, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, wow, this is, this in and of itself is a miracle, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that there is like Arabs that will travel from their mm. lands to sit at his feet and learn from him. Like for me, I was like, yeah, this is deep, you know? Mm. So I think that was also, quite interesting for me um um but like i said the quote about the following of the quran and the sunnah was that that's still the deal you know and so i had made the decision it was quite interesting because i'd made the decision and we went to, to do some tijani dhikr with a tijani sheikh who was in england and i didn't realize it but at all of my like i decided and then my brother rakim yes he made the decision and then oh. his wife and his son so <laughs> like literally in one evening we, we had a jamaat we had a community and that was really the beginning mm -hmm. of the, the first kind of British mm -hmm. Tijani community, you know, mm -hmm. so that was kind of how, yeah, that's how that started. Yeah. Is that a community that is still a big part of your life here in London, in the UK today? Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's mashallah, it's really spread and there's so many, it's, it keeps growing and it's really beautiful. So I, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely got um, the connection to the community is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so you actually um, shared an Instagram post 
really recently that I just want to talk about. So you talk about the role of a woman on a spiritual mm. path and seeking nearness to Allah through a shaykh. Um, so what is it about this path that's helped you to kind of find home and mm. find the answers that you were seeking? And why is a relationship between mm. you and your shaykh so important? Mm, wonderful question, wonderful question. I'll start with the first bit first. And I mm. think what it comes down to is access. You know, mm. as, as, a, as a soul on a journey, mm. you don't want to ever feel like you're, you're shunned or that you mm. shouldn't be there or that your presence is a problem or that your presence is an annoyance or mm. that you don't have the same right to be present mm. as everybody else, right? That's a big, um, mm. that's a big thing for me. That's a big thing for me. You know what I'm saying? Like having this kind of idea of like being able to access to show york you know and i think mm. the first time i ever traveled mm. to medina by i had come across um like the community wherein first of all women there are many female scholars there are many women who are leaders of the, in the community mm. that have show york that have um i mean that have murids that have set up quran schools a lot of the women mm. are most of the, the children or the, all of the children of sheikh ibrahim mm. yes are hafiz as of quran they're very mm. noble women so first of all just to see that representation is a big thing um mm. secondly i think um as a woman i never felt when i was there that i was shunned into a corner like if i'd walk mm. into the room the shayok would say ah sakina salam alaikum how are you you know they would mention me by name and that means so much that when you're a, you know a woman someone actually mentions your name um in a room of in a, in a room full of people i think also you know the fact that there is like i said before spiritual leadership like women are given mm. positions of muqaddamship so they can assist other people on their journey as well so all of this was really inviting for me um and then this idea that like actually you know spiritually we are given the opportunity to aspire mm -hmm. for the same spiritual positions as everybody else you know what i mean so sheikh ibrahim is like who who is you know the branch of the tariqa mm -hmm. that i follow his his whole thing is like wanting people to aspire to become knowers of god mm -hmm. you know and he said quite famously someone said to him why do you give your murids all of your secrets why do you share mm -hmm. everything with them because you don't have to and he yeah. said i'm swimming in oceans of ma'rifa and I want my murids to swim with me, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, and he said like the old, the same as the young, the men, the same mm -hmm. as the women, the poor, mm -hmm. the same as the sultan. Like it's mm -hmm. this idea that everybody has the right to have access to the presence of Allah. And, you know, to me, that's extremely important, like extremely, extremely important. And a lot of, for myself, like my personal, um, goals in life is to really assist women on that journey to understanding that they too have the right to to Wilaya, to becoming mm. friends of God like mm. that yeah. that door isn't closed to anybody mm. you know mm. yeah so that's the first part of your question what was the second mm. part of your question I don't remember um, why why is a relationship with your shape so important so for me in my opinion I mm. think the tariqa itself is mm. um is the, my opinion like the the relationship with you and your sheikh is your tariqa in mm. my opinion you know mm. um because I think that on the journey to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, first of all, you need a guide because you've never been there before. Yet, like, as in, at least in this physical manifestation, our souls know God. <clears throat> but even that, our hearts are, you know, our, our, our bodies are, are still trying to find our way back home. You know? Kina, can I just stop you for one second? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's somebody here that keeps posting some hate comments. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what I would say is, please don't add any negativity okay this conversation and if you have something to say to me directly please direct message me and please yeah. just stop adding negativity to this because i do not know who you are or where you come from and yeah it's, you can say what you want but please message me directly yeah but back to our important conversation alhamdulillah alhamdulillah it's you know so interesting how um the ways in which so social media make people yeah think that they have this kind of act, mm -hmm. this right to communicate mm -hmm. in a certain way but it's also behind a screen it's behind a veil there's no there's no courage in it you know mm -hmm. it's like there's there's we're, we're, we're grown women like let's do it yeah. properly if we're going to have these conversations let's not hide behind screens mm -hmm. you know yeah. but hey um so what was i saying about um so what was, I, what was the question again the sorry question 
<laughs> why, why is your relationship with the shape so important yeah. to you that, that that is your connection to Allah so. yeah so I guess for me like I said I think that like you know the tariqah the, the, first of all the tariqah is a path right a path to Allah first of all mm. secondly you know our hearts know God, but of, but mm. unfortunately we've forgotten. So we mm. seek a guide to take us towards that, towards the presence, mm. right? Yeah. Um, you you seek a guide who knows the way. You know, mm. it's quite simple. If you're going somewhere, if you're going on safari or whatever, mm. you, you you have a guide who mm. to lead you to where you need to go. Um, I think, and primarily the biggest kind of obstacle between us and Allah wa Taala is the nafs. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? It is it is the nafs, and so you have these teachers a to help you diminish and quiet in the nafs and also they represent good examples of how to be you know what i mean um many of them many of our shayukh are so dissolved in the love of the prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and so dissolved in the love of allah that they they teach and guide you just by their being just by their just by their presence mm -hmm. and i think for many of us living in the west and living living the, the, like just average person like it's hard, you know what I'm saying? It's really, really hard. Um, and so for me, they represent an example. You know, a lot, a lot of times when I'm going through my struggles and we do because we're just human, I often think like, what would my shake do? Like, how would my shake handle this situation? What would my shake say in this, in this moment? And I think those things are important, you know, but primarily for me, I think it's a lot to do with just being in the presence of somebody who is striving in, in, in everything they do to be an example of the prophetic way. Yeah. And we didn't have access to be those who were born in the time of Rasulullah mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So these people represent a reflection or a mirror or mm -hmm. a ray of light from the light of the Prophet. So that's mm -hmm. why I think it's really, really important for me. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that mm -hmm. from a personal perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But like I was saying to you last time, when I first kind of found my path and found my shape I was still very skeptical at the start mm -hmm. because of how I was grown up the perception that I had of Sufism because of my culture mm -hmm. yeah uh, so what would you say to somebody that that is skeptical about it like somebody that mm -hmm. believes that oh how can the shake or how can a person have that nearness to Allah mm -hmm. what would you say to them well I guess I would just think about what the sheikh of my tariqa said when mm -hmm. asked the same question like do you need a sheikh and he said there's nothing in our sharia there's nothing in in islamic law that says that you need a sheikh you're not going to go to hell without a sheikh you're not gonna you know it's not there's no legal obligation upon you to find a spiritual sheikh however however if you're sick you know if you're sick um and you need a doctor you know and you choose not to take a doctor who can make you better then the, that choice in and of itself is like it's not the best choice, basically. Mm -hmm. Like one should, one, an intelligent person would choose to, to find themselves a doctor or someone who can help mm -hmm. them for the sake of their lives, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so I think, when I think of it bit personally, um, I, I definitely feel that there's a sickness in most, a lot of people's mm -hmm. hearts. I can speak for myself, there's a lot of sickness in my heart. There's a lot of things that I need to overcome in my mm -hmm. own, in my own soul, soul and in my own self. And being in the presence of these spiritual doctors, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. People who have knowledge of the outer law, people mm -hmm. that are, are, you know, like I said at the beginning, people who are followers mm -hmm. of the prophetic way, mm -hmm. outwardly and inwardly, yeah. um, people that are righteous, people that are generous, people that give, people that have sacrificed their whole mm -hmm. lives, actually, like everything, to be... Um, these examples to be the way I kind of see it, it's a bit like a lighthouse you know mm. what I mean they're steady and they, they're they're like a lighthouse and so we're all drowning in the ocean mm. like please help you know and they they represent that kind of almost like a mm. what's the word almost just like a kind of a steady a steady form of guidance you know what I mean um obviously for many people there are skepticisms around Sufism and I think also that's because many bad things have happened in the name of Sufism the same way many bad things have happened in the name of Islam like we can't lie or you know we can't um deny that you know and so I would never say to someone oh you need to find a sheikh or anything like that but but sometimes there comes a point in a person's spiritual journey where they just want more you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you realize there's only so far I can go yeah. alone, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, when the student is ready, the master appears, right? And, really, and really. What it is. Um, yeah. I think um, 
in my own personal experience, one of the biggest misconceptions is that people believe that um, in a Sufi circle, like the disciples, they worship their shape. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a massive misconception. Yeah. So can you just give a bit of clarity around that? Well? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's also interesting because when I was in Medina Bay with, um, mm -hmm. I had some guests that came with me and, um, you know, mashallah, like what I love about the West African communities is they're not afraid or they're not shy to display mm -hmm. love. Like they really are very loving people and they display their love very yeah. openly. And so my friend was witnessing how some of the people were acting when one of the sheikhs was present. So one of the mm -hmm. sons of Sheikh Ibrahim, as people were mm -hmm. really like, like they were just so excited. They were taking mm -hmm. photos. It was like a celebrity yeah. had come into Medina Bay. And um, so my friend asked Sheikh Mahi about this, you know, and Sheikh Mahi said, well, first of all, like what they love in these people is the fact that they are hafid of Quran, is the mm -hmm. fact that they are, you know, lovers of Rasulullah, is the fact that they remind these people mm -hmm. of God. So even though the, the expression or the way in which we're witnessing the love might be different, the question is more, what is it that they mm -hmm. love? in these people because the same way that these people show love to celebrities for what mm -hmm. what is it that they're really benefiting you yeah. these people benefit they, these people remind them of god so that's the first thing but then he said however he said the the best among the the Maurice who show love are those who follow you know, he said it's about following. He said, he said there are people who love loudly. They make a lot of noise. But when it's time for salah, the sheikh is walking to the masjid and the murid is walking in a different direction. You know what I mean? He said this isn't, this isn't correct to love. You you cultivate that love so that it leads you to follow. And I think that is, you know, that is what it is. So yeah, there is an abundance of love. And sometimes it's also because when you're on a spiritual path and you're starting to do a lot of dhikr and you're starting to do a lot of salawat, you can be experiencing a kind of love that maybe you've never experienced before. And it's overwhelming for you. You don't even know what you, what's happening to you. Yeah. And so when you see these people who remind you of Allah, you're like, you can, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think it's better, the better way is to, Mm. is to just make sure that your love is what makes you follow mm -hmm. your, your your teachers as opposed to you know like i mean people even say that you know sufis worship the prophet even sallallahu yeah. alaihi wasallam which is ridiculous because mm -hmm. why would why would you worship the one who's pointing you to allah we yeah. just love you know yeah. what i'm saying we love yeah. him because of what he points us yeah. to exactly. we love our shayukh because of what they point us to yeah. and what they point us to is everlasting love mm -hmm. so sometimes it is overwhelming but that's not mm -hmm. yeah Sheikh, my sheikh actually said recently he said sometimes people judge the actions of the sufi but not the spiritual state of mm -hmm. the sufi so they don't actually know what's going on inside mm -hmm. they're just mm -hmm. they're just judging what they're based yeah. on what they can see yeah yeah for, for myself, when I found this path, like I was in the same kind of place I was seeking. Mm -hmm. I just kind of, I felt like I'd converted to Islam myself mm -hmm. because the way I was brought up was just mm -hmm. so far removed from the actual principle of Islam. Mm -hmm. It was all right and wrong, halal, haram, hell, heaven, that was it. Um, so I, I, I converted to Islam maybe about 10 years ago, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and then just like, like you said, you were doing all the right actions, doing everything, and then you're seeking more, you're seeking more, and I prayed my prayer to Allah was let me know you before I would mm. do every single night I would pray that and then out of the blue I met my husband and um, mm. a follower of Sheikh Ali I was Sheikh in Senegal as well um and that path it just opened up so much for me mm. and when I asked when I've spoken to my Sheikh about Islam and I said what what does Sufi Islam mean and he said like Sufi Islam embraces all facets of Islam where I think on, it's not to judge any other path of course not but there's so much that we've lost along the way mm -hmm. and this is like it's a call home it's a call mm -hmm. to to what the prophet thought and what islam was back then yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. That's really important um also i feel like on this path people believe that as disciples we're so far from our shades like we're mm -hmm. it's like like again like i was saying before somebody that we worship and we're so mm -hmm. far from but the yeah. truth is, like, the shakes at the other end of the phone for us, mm -hmm. he's a WhatsApp message away, do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's just, that's just something I wanted to clear up as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something where we're so separate and we worship yeah. them. We yeah. are one and he's a guide. And that's Absolutely. Awesome. And what, you know, one time I was with my shake and I was feeling quite emotional because I felt like, I guess I was just overwhelmed by the access that 
that this is someone who has hundreds of thousands of followers around the world but in that moment there was a, a handful of murids um mm -hmm. from from around europe that had the opportunity to really spend time with the sheikh and i was quite i got quite emotional and i was like really like crying and then yeah. when i calmed down i went to see him and i said sheikh you know like you're so big and i'm so small mm -hmm. and i don't know why allah has allowed me to be here and he said between the sheikh and the murid there's no first class or second mm -hmm. class you know yeah. Yeah. there's this idea that like we're here and like it's like no he said you're here because Allah has allowed you to be here that Allah doesn't give the slave what they don't deserve but that was so reassuring like he wasn't like well yes you know I am so big <laughs> you are so small you know it was just like there's no first class or second class and also what you said that your sheikh said about you know the fact that tasawwuf encompasses all um, paths and I think again in our tariqah when we're learning about you know the positioning of our of the tariqah or the positioning of the acts that we do within the quran and sunnah um our sheikh always uses hadith jibril you know where it talks about islam iman and ihsan and this idea that islam you know the five pillars is is you know what we follow and these are actions that we do with our limbs in a way we abstain from it's physical we uh, we use our body to pray we physically go to hajj we give physical money we abstain from physical food and then we have uh, iman which is what we believe in you know uh, quran angels prophets like these are things that require some aspect of your intellect you know you need your aql to be able to consider prophets angels you know um but ihsan itself is to worship Allah as though you see him and even though you don't see him know that he sees you mm. is referring to a spiritual station with Allah mm. this idea that you are in constant contemplation of your Lord in constant consideration of the creator whilst mm. in creation in constant mm. awareness of Allah this for us as people of Tasawwuf we will say well this realm is mm. what the people of Tasawwuf are striving to be yeah. in. Yeah. We're striving to be people of Ihsan. We're striving to be people who are constantly contemplating on and in awareness of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And that is really what um, Sufism for us is mm. about. It's not this separate part of deen, is yeah. my point. It doesn't live outside of deen. It's actually the third aspect of deen that many people neglect. You know, mm -hmm. we think, you know, you hear people say, I'm on my deen. Usually mm -hmm. they just mean I'm praying, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But actually deen is a, is a multi-dimensional kind of concept that yeah. requires you to utilize all parts of yourself, your body, your mind, and your soul, mm -hmm. you know? Thank you for putting that so beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. I just really appreciate all of that. Um, so just in terms of your converting to Islam, was there any struggles that you faced just in that part and how did your family and friends react to you converting? yeah i think the process of coming to islam alhamdulillah was quite easy i think my family like i said i was already quite a seeker so i think my family kind of just they weren't so surprised i don't think they were like oh my god you know and i think again being raised in an environment where we had an awareness of God and we, we acknowledge God but we didn't have it's not like my whole family are Catholic for example or my yeah. whole family so it wasn't like my mom took some disrespect by me choosing a different path than she did I think yeah. in fact my parents were quite understanding because they had around the same age that I become Muslim had moved from Christianity of their parents to Rastafarianism mm -hmm. so they had found their own way too so I think they get it they got it mm -hmm. um so the conversion itself for me was I didn't really find any struggle necessarily. Mm -hmm. I didn't find it to be a struggle. I think maybe some of the struggles came being a female Muslim artist mm -hmm. and, and those were maybe where some of the struggles lay. So I feel like Allah maybe saved my my test for a bit later yeah. because um they because they came, you know. Mm -hmm. But the idea of um becoming Muslim, I think it just felt so natural. Like when I'd made that decision, mm -hmm. um, it just felt like I had just come home really. Oh, um, so you just said that you did experience some struggles in terms of being a female artist. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I guess like coming from a Caribbean background, we're very musical people. You know what I mean? I think most people in the African diaspora, people that were like descendants of those who were stolen and enslaved in the Americas, we found ways to survive by way of music. Music was the way in which we 
I reckon if we didn't have the capacity to sing and make song mm. and dance, I don't know that we would have survived mm. 400 years of slavery. I don't, I don't know that we would have. I think music was our lifeline. It was the way in which we held on to our traditions. It was the way in which we communicated. Mm. All of that to say that music is a massive part of my, my life, my identity. Mm. So coming to Islam and being told that as a woman, I didn't have the right to, to make music, to, to mm. perform, to share, it just didn't really work for me. This idea that music as a whole, as a whole was haram, was, a, was way too, it was way too monolithic in a sense. Like it wasn't a nuanced argument in my opinion, what was being presented to me. The issue though, and I think for me, everyone has the right to their opinion. Like now I no longer do music, I no longer perform hip hop because at this stage in my life, I don't see that it's appropriate. For me, do you get what I mean? I still do poetry, but that I'm going to be on stage and rapping and stuff, it's just not where I am in my journey. It's not the way that I choose to express myself. However, I think the issue is that, unfortunately, a lot of Muslims haven't developed the capacity to have a respectful disagreement. You know what I mean? Like, there are differences of opinion about music. Some say it's halal as long as it's the content is good. As long as you know you're not you're not speaking about anything that's harmful to people. Your your music mm -hmm. reminds people of Allah. And some people believe entirely that it's just way too risky. It the heart <laughs> is too attached to music and it can lead you to do wrong things. So they blanket it out. Both I get like I get both sides mm -hmm. of the spectrum. But when you then use your argument to demonize people and say well you're going to hell Allah is displeased with you all that you do it, it will come to nothing because of the music that you do for me I found that to be very painful you know what I mean and I felt that you know oftentimes I, I see Muslims do this and I think it's such a it's actually quite a very unhealthy thing when a Muslim tells another Muslim Allah is displeased with you you know Allah is angry with you and you think subhanallah like when did Allah send you like a voice note on whatsapp and tell you that like how do you what right do you have like I get it you know there are things we should and shouldn't do but the, but the way you're presenting it as though you are you yourself are like are Allah's mouthpiece like are you Musa alayhi salam like where did you get this like direct like one-to-one -one? and I think those kinds of things were really, really hard um, mm. in the beginning of my journey. And I think now, obviously, I'm at a stage where I don't, you know, internalize people's mm. opinions. And I don't really get people sending me those kinds of messages anyway. But I think that was hard. You know, mm. that was really, really hard. Because when you're a new Muslim, you just want to be accepted. Mm. You know, you just want to be, you just want to be received. And for mm. us in Poetic Pilgrimage, everything that we were doing, all that we were talking about was either like about raising awareness about what was happening in Iraq or Palestine or you know raising awareness of Muslim women who are self suffering or just talking about Allah like there was nothing there was no party music or like you know shake it up there was none of that it was really just about either bringing awareness or, or pointing to Allah so when you're trying to do good and all you're receiving is like a lot of backlash that was very hard but like I said last time it's just part of your journey and if you're sincere in what you're doing you just you just have to keep going you know yeah. and so i know there was a lot of benefit the first time we ever performed outside of england at our concert someone took shahada straight away yeah. like a like a norwegian guy which for me was you know it was from a lot like these these sometimes we perform in places where you can see there are muslims there that are maybe ostracized from the muslim mm -hmm. community sometimes we perform in places you see muslims are drinking alcohol but they when they see muslim women they're like they want to talk to you like salam alaikum or they just want to connect in some way and i realized that there's benefit in sometimes being in places where people don't expect to see muslims or they don't expect to see yeah. practicing muslims and just that presence mm -hmm. means something you know um so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing all of that. Oh. Um, my mind just went completely blank. I had an important question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you obviously shared a lot about your spiritual journey and your faith. Um, and obviously your poetry and your work is a part, I, I guess it's a part of your worship mm -hmm. and, your, mm -hmm. and your faith as well. Um, so moving back to poetry, um, yeah. obviously you just finished your first four mm. week online class which was yeah, I was yeah. part of it. it was it was amazing. I'm so grateful for that. Um, so why why is it so important for you to share the gift of healing through poetry but also the gift of of reconnecting to your faith through poetry as well? Mm. Okay, so the first part of the question, I think for me, I recognise that 
having the capacity to express oneself mm. for some people is a difference between life and death you know what i mean like on yeah. a really dramatic level some people who just don't have the ability or the capacity or the space mm. <clears throat> to really share their truth or to share their pain or to share their trauma they they can implode you know what i mean so on a very simple level the sharing the benefits and the healing potential of just writing of just just getting your thoughts out creating art out of words and and mm. sharing it with others like there's a lot of healing in that i literally mm. see people like even their body change when they become you know able to share when i've, I've literally done workshops where i've seen people come in like a closed mm. flower blood flower bud mm. you know and by the end of it they they're blooming you know what i'm saying and you're like subhanallah this is this is it this is what this is all about so mm. for me that's very very important it's important because i've it's that's what it is for me as well mm. do you know what i mean yeah, yeah so i think that um sharing is yeah like for me I, now i'm at a stage in my life where i don't know what i prefer more i don't know if i prefer performing more or if i pre prefer doing workshops more i think it's like the balance actually because i love 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 to to be part of people's journey and to see this like opening and to see this development um a lot of my work is around the voice of the heart like that's really really important um because i think that from an islamic and from a sufi perspective we're taught a lot about the heart the purification mm -hmm. of the heart you know the the prophet said alayhi salatu was salam there's a part of your body that if it's corrupt the whole body is corrupt if it's sound the whole body is sound and that is the heart so the heart is really it has its own consciousness like mm -hmm. i was saying in, in class you know they when, when in the fetus the heart starts beating before the brain is formed mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so this idea that the heart isn't waiting for the brain to tell it to beat like it has its own its own thing going on mm -hmm. so for me when you're able to tap into that voice of the heart you you have access to like an endless well of beauty you know but learning to kind of the key is learning to kind of translate that into mm -hmm english or whatever language you speak because the heart can speak but sometimes we don't know how to mm. deliver it so i really want so i you know for example i, I know people that are fantastic poets like their mm. wordplay their their, mm. their structuring their rhyming immaculate mm. but oftentimes it just doesn't speak to the heart because it's developed here like it's more like witty skillful kind of poetry but then i've done workshops with refugees who have like a tiny amount of the language that we're right like in mm. english and the sincerity in their two or three lines of poetry is so deeply from the heart that it like it moves me to tears and they can't even speak english properly let alone you know what i'm saying so for me when you can tap into that voice yeah it's it's endless mm. there's endless beauty so that's the first point and what was the second part of your question um why is it well i think you've answered it already why is it so important for you to share the mm. healing through poetry so yeah you pretty much answered it <laughs> yeah yeah i thought i thought you said something about spirituality and poetry that was what i was oh, yeah and why is um it's so important for you to share the gift of like reconnecting to your faith through poetry as well yeah well i think with regards to that i've, I've read some texts where they say that the first islamic art form that we ever had was poetry you know well, that's poetry as well though, isn't it? right is that exactly like it contains a poetic aspect to it so mm -hmm. the idea that like you know a lot of people when they think of islamic art they might think mm -hmm. of calligraphy or you know uh, sacred geometry but the first expression mm -hmm. that we had of some creative expression mm -hmm. that we had as muslims was poetry even in the time of the prophet that the you know the poets would, would recite poetry um in praise of him and in praise of allah so first of all like i see that it's intrinsic actually to our faith i see poetry mm -hmm. is a really important part of our faith in certain parts of the world poetry is how they is what they use to teach islam mm -hmm. you know they use poetry mm -hmm. to teach fiqh or they use poetry to teach um hadith to teach sirah this is quite a common thing mm -hmm. um then you have the whole tradition of praise poetry of the prophet so we have like the burda you know and most communities have their own form of qasidas where they gather to really you know recite and so for me 
this is really, really important because most Muslim communities have poetry. And I think one thing that we as English speaking people are lacking, let's say, is really a tradition of poetry that is in praise mm. of the Prophet. That's not translations of mm. Arabic poems, but like that's being produced by English speaking people. So I think this is something that is really developing and you're having people like Baraka Blue, especially for me, my brother Amir Suleiman and the work that he's doing mm -hmm. in praise poetry of the Prophet. You've got Yusuf Chroma, Tariq Tore, mm -hmm. like there are, and also sisters like Saraya Bar, Rakeya, Munira, mm -hmm. yourself. Like there are women mm -hmm. who are really, you know, um, ahlam, like people, women who are really using their words to, to praise God, you know, mm -hmm. in the English language. But I think that, you know, someone actually said that, you know, a sign of a community's maturity in their faith is when they have developed praise poetry of the prophet in their language mm -hmm. you know like you can tell okay the malay community mm -hmm. they, they found you know in senegalese community or west mm -hmm. africa in somali like people have their traditions and i think you know now is the time for us as english-speaking people to really develop our tradition of praise mm -hmm. poetry too mm -hmm. inshallah um i loved something you were saying just a little bit earlier about mm -hmm. um like holding back self-expression can be a matter of life or death. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, I don't know if you've read the book The War of Art or ever come across it. Um, the, uh, the War of Art, the War of Art, yeah, mm -hmm. not the Art War, the War of Art. Mm -hmm. um, so in this book, um, my husband's been reading it, so he's been like sharing some of the lessons he's learned through that. Mm -hmm. um, but apparently, Hitler himself mm -hmm. um, was an artist, mm -hmm. neglected his mm -hmm. art, and then he turned into you know, he create, he did what he did, you know. Yeah. So I think it's such an important part of us to express what our soul is telling us to do. Um, is there a message you'd like to share with the people watching now who maybe aren't following their hearts mm. or are scared of following their hearts? What would you say to yeah. them? Yeah, I guess, like, you know, it takes courage, doesn't it? Because mm. when you start to, the more you start to listen to the heart, the louder the voice of the heart becomes. Mm. And that is not always easy, you know, mm. when you when you can't deny it. Like when, you, when you, you try and tune into the voice of your heart so much that mm. actually when the, heart, the voice of the heart wants to talk to you, you can't then be like, oh, no, no, be quiet. <laughs> so it requires courage, you know what I mean? It requires bravery. Um, mm. Vulnerability requires bravery. Mm. However... From my perspective when it comes to creative, creative expression i can't i don't know my life outside of this so mm -hmm. i can't imagine what my life would be if i didn't have a space to share what i what i have to say but also to get it out sometimes it's just mm -hmm. getting it out like sometimes i might just have a lot on my chest and i just need to get it out let me just mm -hmm. get it out um whether i share it or not and i think mm -hmm. that would be my message to people is just like just begin you know what I mean don't think of it like I'm trying to be a poet right now and I want mm -hmm. to everyone's going to read my work but the, for me I'm more interested as you know in my class I'm more interested in the process like what happens to you whilst you write mm -hmm. what how what what happens to your heart when you do an exercise saying mm -hmm. dear heart how are you and what how does it feel when you then actually try and listen to that voice and so for me the expression is not always about it being a public performance or if you're an artist this public you know art exhibition but more like what does it do for you what does it give to you when you're able to kind of create the space because for many artists they will say there's a point when you're in your writing that it's almost like time and space mm. is different like time stands still you don't yeah. you, you don't need to eat like there's, you can just be in your zone and and keep going you know so mm. I would definitely say like listen to the voice if you have that desire or that inspiration don't judge yourself or second guess yourself like oh I'm not good enough or you know who cares or I've got nothing to say or who's going to listen to my message just begin and focus on the process more than the product that would be my yeah my advice. Very important. thank you for sharing mm. Um, so in terms of poetry who are you inspired by who are you like your top two poets <laughs> so I guess I really am inspired by poetry of the Sufi tradition just because I think that there's a certain there's a certain way in which they present the, the love of God or the relationship with God that for me it just does something to my heart so again I guess this is a bit tricky because so much gets lost in translation but I really love the poetry of Hafid the most I think out of all the Sufi poets I love his because 
there's a certain playfulness that he has when talking about God. There's a kind of cheekiness as well that I like about it. I like that he, I like that at the time, the people who were like maybe the keepers of the law and the Shakya people, they probably would have like despised what he was writing and probably like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I like that he talks about, he talks in that way anyway. And I, and I love, and I think it's so important that people on the way to God develop their own way with God you know what I mean that you develop your own your own dialogue your own ways in which to communicate with your Lord in you and I think that's really important so I love his poetry for that reason um the playfulness and the, the cheekiness <laughs> um but I guess the poet that I recite the most I recite a lot of the qasidas of my sheikh sheikh Ibrahim Yas and um it's all love poetry for the prophet. So the, before I even understood the language, before I even understood what he was saying, I would hear the recitation in Medina Bay and I would be in tears. I didn't know what was going on. But I was like, I could just feel this deep longing and yearning for the prophet, peace be upon him, that was really like overwhelmingly beautiful. Um, and I was always like, I want to be able to recite this one day too, you know? So I kind of have been practicing and teaching myself how, like with audios, like, trying to copy so I can recite too and alhamdulillah along the way I've been getting different translations and so for me I think he's a poet that I love the most because mm -hmm. the, you know the poetry of the people of Tasawwuf why do we read the Qasidas of, of mm -hmm. the Shayuk of the past it's because mm -hmm. Their poetry was a container for their spiritual state. They would they would be in such a state with Allah Taala mm -hmm. that the poetry became the only way in which mm -hmm. they could almost like offload. And so when we recite their poetry, we do that so that we can taste what they taste. You know, I mean, we want we want to we want to taste that same love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we we can't sleep. Like he talks in his poetry that I can't sleep. Everyone is sleeping, you know, and I'm awake yearning for my beloved, you know, and in, in his poetry, he's, he's in different parts of the world. I'm traveling here I'm in this country and all all I'm seeing is Taha, like all I'm seeing is the messenger. And so for me, I love to recite his poetry because I really want to be in the same state. I really want to taste what he's tasting. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the Sufis and all people. You're breaking up again, Sakina. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on your side. Anybody else see Sakina breaking up? Add her back in. Hi, everybody. Was that just me that it was breaking up for? Did you see Sakina breaking up as well? Let's just add her back in. Hi, Sakina. Sorry, you broke up again. Okay. Um, is it okay now? It seems to be. It seems to be. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People saying it was breaking up. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. We're fine. I think we're okay now. Let's just power okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, did you want to add anything to that last... To the last um, what was I talking... Uh, my Ramadan brain is for real this year. What You're was talking I talking about your favourite poetry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amir, Amir Suleiman is definitely my favourite poet. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, English-speaking poet. I think, yeah. um, for many reasons, I think, first of all, like, he, he's been working on this, like, mega po poem about the Prophet that he's been working on. I think he's completed mm -hmm. it now, but over nine years, you know, like, he was oh. working on this, like, epic piece you know about the prophet which for me if anyone can dedicate that much time to writing about the beloved of allah like i to me that's just a whole different level particularly again in the english speaking world um i think also alhamdulillah he's a good friend friend of the family good friend of myself and my husband so i really appreciate his um his mind, the way he thinks, like sometimes he'll, he'll share with us like his process and I'm like, oh, like it's just, you know, in a really incredible way. Wait, Amir Suleiman, Amir Suleiman. Um, and so I think for me, he's definitely one of my, he's definitely like my favorite poet mm -hmm. from the English speaking yeah. world, definitely. He's yeah. amazing, there's a piece of his called Traveller. I think yeah. I discovered that when I first came to my path as well. It was mm -hmm. just, oh, it hit me right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, 
so now that you shared like some of your favorite poets could you share um the name of maybe three books that have really helped you on your journey as well mm, poetry books po uh, poetry or things to do with faith even finding your mm. spiritual path oh that's so hard because i'm like a book addict so it's really oh, <laughs> it's so can, I just, can i just tell you something like mm. um i know in our poetry class you recommended secrets of divine love mm. um, i ordered that and yeah. i can't even tell you how much i've only read about this much of it mm. but it's impacted me so deeply like i've wow. always read it for people that i know amazing Incredible, incredible. amazing it's amazing because so many people have said similar things actually that they've got it and it's just been really life-changing um amir someone's asking again so amir Suleiman is the poet um so books i would say oh it's very difficult um okay so let's i'll say one of my favorite books about the prophet peace be upon him and a book that helped me to develop a closer relationship with him is a book called our master muhammad his blessed mm. characteristics and attributes or something like that like it's um our master muhammad his exalted characteristics and attributes or something like that and basically it's a book of hadith but it's all about the character of the prophet it's all about who he was in his household how he was with people how he was with animals how he dressed mm. like for me i think sometimes when you know, a lot of the mainstream collections of hadith or a lot of the mainstream ways in which we hear about the prophet is very outer. Like they like to talk a lot about like maybe the battles or, you know, the prophet said this and they use hadith to kind of really hit you on the head with it. But this was like, this book is like, it's like soft, like it soothes you on the inside because it makes you really inwardly understand who your prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam is you know what i mean it's like there's so much in there like one of my favorites is was talking about in his household if anyone in his household would ever call his name he would respond by saying at your service at your service at your service three times he wouldn't say what i'm busy you know at your service this is subhanallah you know like it's just a certain it just i don't know each hadith for me was like a really gentle portrait of of him alayhi salatu wa salam so definitely i would say that's one of my favorite books regarding the Prophet, mm -hmm. alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. um, I would say my one of my favorite books regarding the names of Allah. Like I really l love like studying about the names of Allah because I see mm -hmm. and the attributes of Allah because these are ways in which Allah introduces Himself to us. Mm -hmm. He's if I say to you, my Can name is. Just Sakina, let you know I'm going to get kicked out in two minutes. Okay. Mm. Okay. So the name and the so name. So we, 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 the we can carry on after that. I can. Okay. Yeah, so the book is called The Name and the Names and it's a book about really the attributes of Allah and it really goes into detail and it's very poetic and it really helps you just to understand Allah, you know, because he he said like call me by my names, you know, call me by my beautiful name. So So I would say that book and then should we wait until the next should we Continue. Yeah, I what, what I can do is end this one. I can end, can end it yeah. here and I'll start another one. So just join me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, everybody join us in the Love next it. one. Like two <laughs> seconds. <laughs> okay, this is, we're just going to carry on with the interview with Sakina. Just wait for everybody to join again and we can get going. What a great conversation though, Sakina's so full of wisdom and yeah, I'm so happy that we're having this conversation. So let's just wait for Sakina to join again and we can carry on. But you guys, if you have any com any questions you want to ask Sakina, because we've, we've got another hour now, I know we probably won't go on for that long, um, but if you do want to ask anything, feel free to comment below. Hopefully the connection's good this time. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. So the connection's the, the connection was going as well. So. Yeah, no problem. Is it how's it now? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So, yeah. So you were talking about your favourite book, so I think Yeah. So yeah, so the second one, like I said, is a book called The Name and the Names. Um mm -hmm. and I guess it comes from this idea that like, you know, there's no difference between like when you call the name of of your lord 
then there's no distance between the name and the one who is being named. Like when you call the name of Allah, you you almost like are inviting or allowing yourself or striving to be in the presence of that name. You know what I mean? So the more you say Ya Latif, for example, you begin to feel that subtlety and that gentleness and that kind aspect. So it's really good. I love I love that book, The Name and the Names by Tosun Bayrak. Um, poetry book, I would say one of my favorite books of poetry is called love poems i always get confused because there's two books one but it's called love poems let me just double check well, i think it's love poems from god um which is a it's a collection it's an anthology of poetry from this from the mystics so it's it has poetry by like rabia al-adawiya rumi hafid but then it also has poets from the from the christian tradition like saint Teresa of avila saint julian of norwich um francis azizi it also has like people from I'm not even sure if they would be regarded as Hindu, but like maybe just mystics from the um, mystics from the uh, like Indian Indian continent as well. But not they weren't Sufis. I don't exactly know what faith they were. But my point is, is that it's so powerful. Like it's so so powerful because what you come to realize is that on the on the mystical path, on the mystical journey, there's not that much distance you know when you when you read the poetry of Rabia when you read the poetry of Saint mm -hmm. Teresa you don't if you didn't know the names you wouldn't know this is a Sufi mm -hmm. this is a Christian this is a mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying so let me just quickly check the name mm -hmm. um love poems from God I think it is yeah love poems from God mm -hmm. okay. and it's called self 12 sacred voices um from the east and the west okay Twelve sacred voices from the east and the west. So I guess asking me book recommendations is really difficult because <laughs> I'm like looking at my books and I'm like, and these are only my books that I have here, not even all of my books in storage. Um, there's another book that I think is really helpful, actually, mm -hmm. which is called Spiritual Teachings of the Prophet, mm -hmm. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is also a book of hadith as well. Mm -hmm. But what I like about it is that, you know, a lot of, aspects of the spiritual path that we follow it it has hadiths which almost back it up you know what i mean because again a lot of people say well we're in the quran and the sunnah duh, 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 duh. but then you read these books and you're like actually these things that exist this idea of making dhikr this idea of being in the presence this idea all these different things and so i found that to be one of the most helpful books for me on my journey as well okay well, thank you for sharing that. Hopefully, maybe you can share on your stories later. Sure, sure. A lot of people are asking yeah. the names and the names of the authors. So, yeah, yeah if you can do that, that would be great. Um, mm. Right, we're going to come to the end soon. Um, mm. One of my last questions is, if you could share one message with the whole entire world and reach everybody, what would it be? Good God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um... I mean, if it was just like a general message, I would definitely just say, be gentle with yourself. Like be gentle with yourself, where you are, where you are in your journey. Um, I think sometimes, and this is something that I had to do for myself, sometimes when you catch yourself and you, and you are aware of like mm. how you speak to yourself, like sometimes the, our inner voice towards ourselves we wouldn't speak like that to our worst enemy sometimes. Sometimes we're so harsh with ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's small things, but it's not small when you're like, oh my God, I'm so stupid. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. What's wrong with me? Like, that's, that's not small when, you're const when your inner voice is constantly speaking to you in this way, you know? And so I had to really retrain myself. I had to almost retrain my inner voice to be gentle i'd be like all right so it's okay we got this girl like we're gonna be okay don't worry you know and it just changes how you engage with the world it changes how you engage with yourself so being gentle with yourself like we're, this whole this whole life is just a journey you know what i mean you're gonna make mistakes you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna slip you're gonna hurt somebody something i've come to realize is that on this journey called life, you're gonna hurt people whether you mean to or not. And mm -hmm. sometimes the people that you're gonna hurt the most are those that you love the most. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just the way of the way. Like you can't, like, you know, a parent can love their child too much. Mm. Oh, it's frozen. Come back. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we're constantly, uh, 
on a journey we're constantly on a journey and we can't help it sometimes we can't we, we don't mean to hurt each other but that's just how how it how it is so just being gentle with yourself um mm -hmm. and taking each day as it comes mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um finally um mm -hmm. tell everybody what you're up to at the moment what you hope to hold for you i know people are asking about poetry workshops so the floor is yours <laughs> Yeah, so um, I guess at the moment, well, this, this lockdown has kind of, I guess, opened up different possibilities for ways in which I can communicate and connect and share with people. Um, one being obviously doing online courses. And so I did my first one, which was really powerful, really yeah. successful in the sense that my my intentions were, were realized you know mm -hmm. i wanted the people to have this connection i wanted the people to have this ability mm -hmm. to connect with themselves and from the feedback i received you know it seemed to have been working or it seemed to have worked in a way so i think for me that's something that i really want to continue um because there are people from all over the world that want to join the workshops that have you know mm -hmm. you were there we had people coming in from like alaska mm -hmm. and bosnia and Canada and you know South yeah. Africa like it was a lot from everywhere all over the UK mm -hmm. all over America so I it, ordinarily I'll never be able to get all those people in the same space so it's definitely something that I really want to develop more um mm -hmm. I've been trying to and I've been making intentions for, for like years to kind of create a poetry collection but I really I really 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 want to get my poetry collection mm -hmm. out I've got all I've yeah. been gathering all my poems there's so many I write so many bits all the different places so I've kind of gathered about a hundred poems so I'm like okay I need to kind of put this together so I really want to have my poetry book as you know I'm doing my master's in inshallah um as you know I'm having my, doing my master's in creative writing for therapeutic purposes so that's a really important thing for me um I definitely want to start doing more writing retreats so I've been speaking to my husband maybe about doing some retreats in Portugal um and also in the UK um what else what else I think that's it really. I, just... I believe a while ago you were talking about releasing an album. Is that something that's still happening? Or... Yeah, exactly. That's like, it's like 99% finished, literally. It's really almost finished. I just have like one or two more songs to release. The whole Corona thing just meant I've not been able to get into the studio, but it's really yeah. ready to go. So we want to release some videos from like some poetry videos from that too. I'm really, really, really pleased with the product. Um, so there's that. Yeah. So just, Sakina, the connection isn't great again. I might just put you removed and add again. Sorry, guys. Um, there seems to be some connection issues again on Sakina's end. So hopefully, I can just add her in and finish this conversation. Hello. Oh. Hello? The connection is like really on and off, but it's okay. We're almost at the end. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just that really teaching, mm. sharing, mm. creating, just, just trying to... Do you know when you'll be announcing your next poetry class? Because I know a couple of people have asked about that a few times. Yeah, so it probably will be after Ramadan now. I will be doing um, an online course, an online class with uh, the Gamma Collective, which will be, mm. I believe, next week, Saturday, but I'll post about that. Mm. Um, but yeah, my actual next quarter, probably, it will definitely be after Ramadan. I just kind of want to process everything that happened and find, you know, see see where to go next. But as soon as it's up, I'll let people know. Um, but yeah, probably after Ramadan, I think. And where, where can people find you online? Do you have a website and social media channels and that kind of thing? Yeah, I guess the, the best way really is Instagram. Like, it's kind of like, I'm on Facebook too, but this is, like, I think this is the, the platform that I'm more present on. So if you are wanting to get in contact with me, definitely um, Instagram. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I know if you, if some people have a few questions. Are you happy to answer? Or... Sure, sure. Um, so I'm just going to scroll up and see what people mm. are saying. Um... It's just fine. 
so another poetry workshop you just answered that um what's the book name again um secrets of divine love which um Sai was asking and that's the book you spoke about in your poetry class so that's mm -hmm. that and then we have the hater again for some reason that doesn't have anything better to do um has anybody got any questions for Sakina? I know somebody was asking about uh, the process of awakening. Mm. Um, is that something you'd be happy and comfortable to talk about? Or Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean... I think it's different for everybody. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I don't think there's, like, one, one way, but I definitely would say that, like, I do get messages from a lot of sisters, actually, who are... Um, very very much wanting to begin that spiritual journey and i think one of the biggest ways in which you know that your journey is about to begin is the fact that you yearn for it you know what i mean the mm -hmm. fact that you want it that you want a guide or you want god or you want that connection mm -hmm. to me that's the beginning of your journey because there's no way that you can yearn for god before mm -hmm. god has allowed you to yearn for him you can't yearn mm -hmm. for god first you know what i mean allah take one step to me I'll take 10 steps to you is what he says but actually really in reality you can't put your foot towards God unless Allah has allowed you to put your foot first foot towards him or your first step towards him so in reality the fact that you have this desire is actually the beginning of your journey you know and the, the Sufis say that Allah would not make your tongue wet with a prayer unless he wanted to answer it you know so the fact that people are, are yearning for God when I when I speak to people at that stage I'm like mashallah like your journey is about to begin you know the key is always I think about and then what my my, my shayof what they teach is about sincerity making your um your intention because sometimes people are like oh i need a shake or i want a shake but the the shayof mm -hmm. they say actually make your intention solely for god and god mm -hmm. will present to you who you need for your journey you know like mm -hmm. make your don't make your intention the community where i want to follow a tariqa i want to follow a path but actually what you really want mm -hmm. is god himself and mm -hmm. so the more you make your intention for god allah will open up Mm. And, and present to you like you said the teacher will appear so I mm. think you know like I said awakening I mean it is I mean that means so many different things to so many different people yeah. but I think my the first primary thing is that the fact that you're yearning for something it me and especially that something yeah. or that reality being God means that God wants to give you himself you know mm. and so our shayok they often say mm. may Allah give you Allah you know may Allah mm. give you himself like because ultimately that is that's what we want mm. yeah I think um the same person is asking um about the uncontrollable crying phase and mm. I think like what we've said is it's a different process for everybody um but in terms of the uncontrollable crying personally for me that stage kind of came when I was unlearning and unconditioning everything that I knew myself to be. Like they say, empty yourself of yourself yeah. so you can be filled, filled with this light. So yeah. maybe that's what you're going through right now. But if that's something you want to talk about, yeah. feel free to DM me uh, and Sakina if you're comfortable with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we can give you exactly. some more guidance on that. And I think that that phase is, <laughs> for me personally, oh, I'm, I'm a bit of a crier. Oh. I'm a bit of a crier so I don't yeah. think I've ever really left the crying thing <laughs> you know there's just different ways you get some people who, they, who when they have a spiritual experience they laugh they just can't stop laughing you know you get some people they just can't stop mm. crying I think you know the, the soul and the mm. spirit is has different ways to express itself and like you said in the beginning it is a purification you know maybe you realize mm -hmm. how far distance you've been from god your whole life and that just mm -hmm. brings you to tears sometimes there are different types of emotion like sometimes i know when i'm crying based on my emotion and sometimes you can feel when your heart is crying you know your heart is almost grieving mm -hmm. something so sometimes the heart is is expressing itself too you know what i mean so there are different there are different ways i don't know that i would call it a phase necessarily because mm -hmm. a phase would would indicate there's some beginning and there's some end i don't know that that the crime will ever end but um it's just one of the ways in which the heart chooses to express itself and that's totally fine as well you know the sahaba they would cry um you know rasulullah he would cry so to cry some in some hadith they say that if you see people crying for the love of god and you yourself are not feeling that same emotion you should evoke you should try and force yourself to cry because there's some kind of purification in that process so yeah, as long as you're not like 
I don't know, crying in a, in a mournful way or it's, it's causing mm -hmm. you pain and you can't get on with your life. But if mm -hmm. things that remind you of God make you cry, then mashallah, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so it's good to have a soft heart. Yeah. So I hope that helped to the person that was asking. Um, is there anything at all you'd like to add to this conversation, Sakina, anything you'd like to end with? Um, really, I just want to thank you um, for having this platform, for using your platform to, to share. Like I said in our last interview, like I really love your work. I love what you're doing. So I would I like I love your artwork as well. So I would just say, like, keep keep it up, you know, and I think it's really it's really beautiful to have these spaces, to have these kinds of conversations. I'm grateful to you for the question. You know, it's not I love having the opportunity to have these kinds of conversations because I think that the more I, the more as time continues and the more I'm like communicating with people, I realize how, how thirsty people are for Allah. Like people really want, or just for, for that, that connection. And so, especially as women, there's been so many unfortunate circumstances where women have had bad experiences with, with you know, shayuk or what have you. So just to be able to have a space to have these conversations as women, as yeah. poets, you know, is really powerful. So I'm really grateful. Oh, thank you. Well, maybe we can do this again. Sometime. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we can do this again sometime um, with a specific topic, but we can talk about that down the line. But um, I just want to thank you so much, so much for being here, for giving so much of yourself, for speaking so honestly, and for sharing yourself and sharing your heart with us. So thank you so much for everything that you do. And thank you for this time and for putting this time aside. I mean, I mean. Thank you, Sakina. I mean. Lots of love to you all. Thank you thank so you much. To everybody for joining. Yeah. Hello, okay. Alaikum. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Okay, thank you so much everybody for joining. Um, so these uh, videos are going to be edited up um, with the first interview and I'll be putting them on YouTube so I will share that when it's up. Um, if there's anybody that you know that you'd like to be interviewed on these Soul Journeys um, Insta Lives, please send me a message. If you've got a story to share, send me a message and let's do this. Um, but thank you so much to Sakina, to everybody for being here for such a wonderful conversation. I appreciate you guys so much, sending you lots of love and I'll speak to you soon.